Well, a few years ago when uh, Stephanie and I were asked back in, when we lived in California, we were asked to be part of the, the uh, Focus Mentoring Program, and one of the things that they did w- right off the bat, I don't know if they still do this, but uh, they gave us a test, a general test of Bible knowledge, and that was intimidating. And I, I took that test, and uh, I just was certain that I failed it, and I, I, I probably did, but uh, I, I was also worried when I was taking it that, that human nature, you know, says uh, when you take this test, it's because they're going to look at your answers, and they're going to judge you for it. And, I, and, and, and that's the way I felt. But the reality was that's not what they were doing at all. It was really just for our own edification. But it did expose for me a hole, a gaping hole in my Bible knowledge. And that was uh, in the area of the minor prophets. And uh, I realized I just don't know that much. Uh, of course, you read things here and there, but as, as to putting it all together or doing a, a survey of them, I was weak in that area. And so I committed at that point after the other studies were done, I committed to a project, and uh, it's been a long project. Actually, I'm not even done with it, uh, but I started the project of, of delving into the Minor Prophets, and I've, I've not been, uh, over seven years, not been super consistent about this, but I've been taking it at, in, in bites. And, uh, and then I put a lot of work on myself in addition to that, <laughs> in that I thought it would be a good idea. I think it's still a good idea. But it took more work than I thought where I started indexing and summarizing the, 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 the minor prophets each book in the back of my Bible. I've got this nice uh, section for notes in the back, and so I've, I've done all that, summarized and outlined and indexed the scriptures and then cross-referenced them in the pages. That was a lot of work, uh, and it's still a lot of work, and I'm not quite done, but I am through uh, the book of Haggai. And... As I was just recently finishing up that part of my little project here, I realized that there are some poignant lessons to be had in the book of Haggai from uh, for this time of year as we start to approach the, the spring holy days. Uh, and so I thought we might just do a, a little survey of the book of Haggai. It's not very long, two chapters, uh, but I thought we might uh, find it relevant to do a survey of the book of Haggai uh, for this first message today. So if you would, turn with me to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, chapter 24. And maybe as we start to delve into the book of Haggai and see its relevance for us today, maybe we can start with this notion in mind. Uh, Luke 24 and verse 44. Now this is just after Christ had been crucified and uh, they had rolled away the stone and he was gone and the disciples there now were wondering, kind of scratching their heads and, and feeling a little bit lost and not knowing exactly what to do next? What, what were they supposed to do? What had happened? Everything that they had just done for the last three and a half years seemed to uh, go away here now. <laughs> seemed to. Uh, but we pick it up here in, in verse 44 of Luke 24. And he said to them, these are the words, which it's, these guys were walking, they were kind of lost and aimless, and they were walking to this other village, and, and they were talking on their walk about what, what was happening and and. and uh, it says there that Jesus comes behind them, and they don't really, uh, it says their eyes are withheld from knowing who he was. I'm not sure exactly what form that took, but they didn't understand who he was. They knew somebody was there, but didn't know who. And uh, so he starts talking to them. Anyway, here in verse 44, he finally says to them, uh, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all of these things must be fulfilled that were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And so we have this, this notion here that all of these things that were written in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms, they do point to Christ. When we read prophecy, it, it, it points to what God is doing to all of mankind through Christ. 
So this is the notion, I think, that we should start with when we delve into prophecy. Skip down here. Uh, This is also an interesting notion here in verse uh, 52. It says, and they worshipped him. This is after now he, he, he started to bless them, and, and it says while his hands are still out, he's taken up into the heavens. And they said they, they worshipped him, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And, and they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. So why did they return with great joy? Well, because everything that they had been taught and everything that they were waiting for had proven to be true. Christ had come. He had revealed Himself again after He had been raised up. It validated everything that they knew. They had now a a clarity of what was going to happen yet still. That everything that they had been taught about, the kingdom of God and and, uh, all of that, everything that they had been taught, it was confirmed. It was a joyous occasion. They understood. Now they, now they go back with a renewed spirit. They're ready to move forward. They understand what's happening. Okay, let's go to Haggai, verse 1, chapter 1 and verse Here we start out now with the the scene being set 50 years before this, when Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed the temple, Judah had been taken into captivity in Babylon, and now here it says in Haggai chapter 1 verse 1, that in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the, uh, the son of Shealtiel governor of Judah and son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say it is uh, the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. So if you look at the history on this, back in the book of Ezra, you can see that Cyrus had sent them back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. But the locals had started to harass them. Uh, and, and it's amazing when you do read the, the book of Ezra, which you should do if you are studying the book of Haggai, you should read the book of Ezra, which is parallel, and the book of Zechariah as well. But when you look back at what they did, this was no small persecution. This wasn't just uh, some thugs harassing them. The, there are texts in the book of Ezra that go back and, and show the letters that they were writing uh, that corresponding with the king. So this is, this, is, uh, this is a major uh, uh, harassment. Uh, this is the type of harassment we see in the end times. It just says they'll uh, deliver you to councils and that kind of thing. This is a uh, very high-level uh, obstruction that they were facing. In fact, let's look at Ezra. If you go to, now, we're going to go through the entire book of, of Haggai, so any time that we go somewhere else, just be sure to keep your place in Haggai. But let's look at Ezra really quick. Uh, Ezra chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4 and verse 4 says, Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. And they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus of King Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So this is a big deal. And if you go back and you read the text, you know, sometimes I, when, I, when I think about these things just conceptually, in the, the overarching way, I think about these times, these ancient times, as being maybe a little bit less sophisticated. 
And that's really not the case. When you, re- you read this and you read the texts, that the, the letters that are sent back and forth from the king to these uh, sort of local principalities and governments and uh, you know, the people that were involved in, in leadership there, uh, there's really nothing unsophisticated about it. It, it, this is, it is ancient times, but uh, it is like you could read them from, they, they, as they were letters that might be written today between Congress and the White House. Very high-level situation here. So this is what the people of Judah are facing as they've been sent back to rebuild the temple of God, which had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, uh, back to Haggai in verse 10. Therefore the heaven, this is again because they had become distracted here, they had, uh, they had become discouraged by this harassment that they were receiving, this obstruction that they were receiving from doing the job that they were supposed to do. Uh, God says, therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil. And upon that which the ground brings forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of your hands. They were spinning their wheels. Why? Because they had become distracted. Because they had lost focus. They had lost their priorities. And I wonder, I ask this question of myself, and I'll ask it of you. Have we become distracted? Have we lost our focus? And if so, how so? What is it that's taking us away from the work that God has set us to do? Let's look at Romans. Again, keep your your finger there. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, God's talking about withholding the fruit of the earth, withholding the fruit of their labor. Here he says in Romans 6, in verse 20, for when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. That means you didn't have any. If you serve sin, you don't have any righteousness. What fruit did you have in those things that you're now ashamed of? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you're probably way ahead of me. I I skipped a whole page, didn't I? All right, we'll back up a little bit. Back up a little bit since we're, uh, well, let's go ahead and finish this in, in Romans. The wages of sin is, 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 the, is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there is no fruit from those distractions, the, 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 the worldly things that have taken us away from what God is doing. On the contrary, God has given us a pathway for eternal life and a place in the work that He is doing. Okay, let's back up for just a second. We'll go back to Haggai verse th- uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Then came the word of the Lord uh, by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it a time for you, O you, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? They had lost track of their priorities. Now therefore, verse 5, thus says the Lord, consider your ways. This is why we had to come back to this. This is important. Consider your ways. I have a a reader's Bible. It's got a little bit more uh, comfortable modern English. Uh, I like reading that sometimes. It, it's like any other version. You've got to be careful with it. It translates some things well, and other things have some issues. But, uh, but I, like it. I like it for some things that it says. And one of the things it says is, uh, think very carefully. 
here. Consider your ways. Think carefully about what you're doing and what you have done. You've sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none warm. And he that earns wages earns wages to put them in a bag with holes. Again, spinning their wheels. Thus says the Lord of hosts, again, consider your ways. Think carefully. Spend time thinking about what you're doing. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified, says the Lord. He's saying here, it was time. It was time to rebuild the temple. They were saying it wasn't time. They were saying, I got some other stuff I would rather be doing. God says, no, this is is the time. Your priorities are mixed up. You're living in a sealed or paneled house while my house lies in ruin. Now, God doesn't need a house. God has no need of the shelter that comes with a house. This is a matter of prioritizing the business of God. So he says, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain, bring wood in the house, uh, and build the house. I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified. And he starts talking about their personal lives. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. When you brought it home, I did blow upon it. You had this thing, you thought you had it, and I, whew, I turned it into nothing, into dust. I put it in the wind. Why? Because my house that is waste and you all run into your own houses. And again, this is why we went to Romans 6 and we read about the fruit that God says that he has, he has kept from them. He kept it from them. He withheld the fruit of their labor because their priorities were mixed up. Okay, so we'll pick it up in verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet. As the Lord their God had sent him, the people did fear before the Lord. Then spoke Haggai, the Lord's messenger, to the Lord's, uh, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So now they've turned, they've done what God's asking them to do. They've started to build their temple, they've, his temple. They've started to be about his business. And now he says, I am with you. I'm with you. He encourages them, keep going. You're doing the right thing. I'm with you. And the Lord stirred the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and did work on the house of the Lord, the Lord of hosts, their God. This is another uh, place where I like what my reader's Bible uh, says. It caught me off guard the first time I read this, but it says, well, there's a couple of notes here. It says, first of all, the Lord, and I've been saying the Lord every time we come to it. In the King James, it's written Lord, it's spelled in all caps, Lord, as in the name of the God, uh, name of God, but that is not God's name. And I think we have to be aware of that as we read these. That this this is in place of Jehovah, the Eternal, the self-existent God, the Eternal. This is God's name, the Eternal, not merely Lord. That is not God's name. Eternal, the Eternal God of Hosts. Hosts. Now I feel embarrassed that I read over this word for many many years, like my whole life, and did not, did not really grasp it. And it's one of those words that it still means what it says. This is not a mistranslation. He is the Lord of hosts, the God of hosts, the eternal God of hosts. But hosts is an archaic word for armies or a large group or an army, a standing army prepared for battle. And so the first time I read this in the Reader's Bible and it said the God of armies, I sort of was taken aback. And I thought, what what does that mean? That can't be right. Is that right? Is that what it says? I don't remember hearing that before. And so I went and I looked it up, and sure enough, that is one of the definitions. But in this context, when God says, I am with you, 
I am the eternal God of hosts, of armies. Boy, that changes the, the vision, doesn't it? Changes the impression that you get or the feeling that you get. If I read Lord God of hosts, because that's an archaic word and I don't really know the full definition of it, it I can just read right past it. But when it says the God of armies, and you have this vision of God who is immovable, that he has, as Jesus said, I could call down more than 12 legions of angels if, if it were my time to fight. Right? God does have these. He doesn't need the armies. He could do things by fiat, but he has them. He has them, and it, and it speaks to his omnipotence, to his power, that, that he, neither he, his character, can be moved, nor can his plan be moved. That is, he is going to do what he's saying that he's going to do. This is an important fact when we read this. That's just an aside. The reason I keep getting lost here is because my, my, when I went to print my notes, it printed on both sides of the page, and I have never had that happen. I don't know why it happened, and I've never spoken from notes like that, so I'm forgetting to, to flip the page. Anyway, now you know my secret. Okay, let's go to verse 15. It just gives the date here. So we'll go into chapter 2 uh, chapter two, and verse 1. In the seventh month, in the 21st day of the month, came the word of the, uh, the Lord, or the eternal, by the prophet Haggai. If I say Lord, please forgive me for that. I'm just reading because that's the way it's printed. But just know that God's name is the eternal. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? So there were people here who had actually seen Solomon's temple. They had seen the brilliance of it, the glory of it. And, and when you read this in Ezra, those people that had seen it, when they went and they saw the foundations, they wept. They actually wept aloud. Because in their eyes, it was kind of pathetic compared to what they had seen when they were young men. But God's saying something different here. God says, look at verse 4. You're seeing this... this, uh, this foundation here. You're seeing the beginning of this temple that pales in comparison to what you've known. But be strong, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. And be strong, all of you people of the land. So he encourages the leaders and the people, all of them, and he says, be strong and work. For I am with you. I am with you. Says the eternal of hosts or armies according to the word that i covenanted with you when you came out of egypt so my spirit remains among you fear not remember him saying to the children of israel at the edge of the red sea stand still and see the salvation of the lord fear not see the salvation of the lord He says, I'm, I'm there with you in the same way, the same way that I was there with those guys in Egypt. They didn't see any way through. Now you're here, you're being harassed not by Pharaoh, but by these uh, locals and the little principalities that are around, and they're just harassing you, and they're obstructing you, and they're trying to stop you at every turn. But I'm here in the same way that I was with you back when I brought you out of Egypt. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Again, referring to the future, the return of Christ to the, to, to the earth. And I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. 
In the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year, Darius, uh, the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, "Thus says the Lord of hosts: Ask now the priests concerning the law." So now he's shifting gears, shifting gears here, and he's asking Haggai, "Look, have have a he's have a conversation, have a conversation here with with the priests. Ask him this question." If one bears holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, talking about the Levites and the, in the, the priestly duties here, and his skirt does touch bread or the pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest said, no. They knew. These guys knew their stuff. They were well-versed in the rules, and they knew if they carried this sacrificial uh, uh, consecrated meat in the, in the hem of their garment and it touched the anything else, would any of those other items, the bread or the wine or any of that other stuff they're used for the ceremony, would that become holy just because this, this blessed holy meat is in contact with it? And the priest said no, no. So then uh, Haggai said, if, if one that is unclean by a dead body touches any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest said, it shall be unclean. Yeah, of course, that would defile this this sacrifice, this, this meat. Then answered Haggai and said, so, this is, uh, so is this people unclean, that is. So is this nation before me, says the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean. So they had, uh, let's go back to Ezra 9 again. Ezra 9, this is one of the issues that the people had. This is a separate message now, all around the same thing. This is around uh, God's command here to, to rebuild the temple. But here in Ezra 9, we see what God is talking about when he says these people are unclean. They're, they're, they, are, they are defiled. Ezra 9, verse 1, Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the, pri- and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. So the people had taken on the ways and the culture of these other uh, these other uh, tribes and societies, ones that did not fear God, did not obey God. They had become intermingled in them. It says in, in verse 2, for they have taken of their daughters for themselves and their sons so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yes, and the hand of the princes and the rulers have been chief in this trespass, so it goes all the way to the top. Everybody in, 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 had, had become corrupted. They had, they had begun to, uh, again, mix their priorities up. They had intermingled with uh, these other societies that did not obey God, did not fear God. They had, uh, they had become corrupted. And so, again, I have to ask myself, and I'm going to ask you, how intermingled are we with the world around us. Those ways that we have to consider. How intermingled have we become with the world around us? How many of their causes have we taken up? How, many of the, how, how much of their way of thinking have we taken up? That's the issue here. That's the issue. These, these people had... The, 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 the tribe of Judah was not going to... Uh, rub off their holiness onto these other societies. The other way around, they, the other societies were going to corrupt them. That's the question that Haggai asked of the, of the Levites. So where are we as individuals? Where are we as a body in that regard? Let's go to James chapter 4. 
I find it harder and harder to keep myself out of it. The world is pervasive, insidious. The way of thinking out there is off track. And the onslaught from media is never ending. We're being inundated constantly with their way of thinking, their behaviors, their cultures. We've got to to be here. We have to live among that. But how much have we let affect us? It's a question I've got to ask. It's a question I struggle with. And I know I can feel it. I can feel it working on me. Sometimes it, sometimes it works me over. But God says, consider your ways. James 4, in verse 2, you lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war and yet you have not. Because you ask not. You ask, and you receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it on your lusts. Or I think the New King James says, so you can spend it on your pleasures. You adulterers and adulteresses. Oh, that's, that's pretty heavy language. Can you imagine... Somebody standing up here and saying that directly to you, it's one thing to sit here and read it, being said to someone else, but could it be said of us? And this is not just about literal adultery. Of course, that's part of it, that's in there. But this is about being intermingled with the world, spiritually. You adulterers and adulteresses, know not, uh, do you know not that your friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Being a friend of the world, allowing that, the, the world's way of thinking, the world's cultures to, to, to become part of us, leads us to sin which separates us from God. But that's the one thing that we've got. The one thing that we've got is that we're not separated from God. The rest of the world is separated from God. They're all separated from God. If they, if they have not been called according to His purpose and, and living by the Holy Spirit, they're separated from God. There's a wall between them and God. We don't have that wall. We have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 6 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are the members of Christ? That is, we're extensions, appendages of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? Certainly not. That would be ridiculous. Do you not know that who is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, says he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. It's a serious juxtaposition. Also a good one if we're on the right side of that equation. All right, let's go back to Haggai 2. I broke my rule and I took my thumb out. Haggai 2 and verse 15 is where we're at. And now I pray you consider from this day and upward. Uh, again, so he's asking, he's asking the people to consider, the people being the tribe of Judah at that time, but really we've got to bring it home to us. 
I pray you consider from this day and upward before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the eternal. Since those days were when one came uh, to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the press fat or the, this is the old English, the wine press, to draw out 50 vessels of the press, there were but 20. I smote you with a blasting and with mildew and hail and all the labors of your hands, yet you turned not to me says the Lord. Consider now from this day and upward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, even from the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Think carefully about it. So he, God, God with not, not only withheld blessings, but he actually, he actually, at this point, administered a chastisement. It says, I smote you with blasting and mildew and with hail and the labors of your hands and all the labors of your hands. So he changed uh, the outcome of what they would normally expect for the, the fruit of their labor to be. He gave them a trial. So when we go through trials, do we consider our ways? Verse 19, is the seed yet in the barn? Yes, is the, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree has not brought forth from this day, I will bless you. He goes back to blessing them because they're doing what he's asked them to do. And again, the word of the eternal came to Haggai in the 24th day of the month saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. Again, recalling memory to God's plan. This is, this is referring to the end of the age. I will overthrow the kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of kingdoms, of the heathen. And I will overthrow the chariots, and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the eternal I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and I will make you as a signet, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. This is the end of the book here. Again, there's more. You have to take this with Ezra and with Zechariah. But here we, we see that God has taken his people. They have turned. They have uh, been about his business. They've done what he has asked them to do. God says that he will bring his plan to pass. It will come about. What God says he's going to do, he's going to do. Zerubbabel here, when he says, I will make you as a signet, is a type of Christ. Let's look at Zechariah 4. Getting close here, but Zechariah 4. Verse 6, Then he answered and he spoke to me. I'm sorry. I did that a little abruptly. Zechariah 4, verse 6, Then he answered and spoke to me, saying, this is the word of the Eternal to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So I just wanted to read this to show that this is, though as we extrapolate the lessons of the book of Haggai, the, the, the need to have our priorities straight, the need to be about God's business, building the temple, that it's important to understand that this is not something that we do. We don't build a, a building like this and say, look at what we have done. This, again, this comes from God. God says that uh, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. By my spirit. And then if you skip down to, the, uh, to verse 8, it says, moreover... The word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. Again, now we're talking not about necessarily the governor of Judah, but about Jesus the Christ. 
and his hands shall also finish it. And she'll know, and you shall know that the eternal God of hosts has sent me to you. All right, just a couple more scriptures here in 1 Corinthians. Again, we read that in Zechariah 4, 9, that, that Christ has started this. He's laid the foundation, and he's going to finish the building. And you and I are bricks in that wall, in those walls. We're part of what he's doing. We have to check ourselves, consider our ways, that are we aligned with what he's doing? Are we aligned with him? Are we submitting our will, subjugating our will, submitting our will to his will? That was, uh, that's what was missing with the people of Judah here. Okay, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6. Familiar scripture here. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Again, this is work that God is doing. He uses us. We have a part to play, but he says uh, God gives the increase. So neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but God gives the increase. Now that uh, he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor, for we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And skip down to verse 16. Do you not know that you are, you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? This works on a couple of levels. We are individually temples of the Holy Spirit, and we are as a, as a collective body temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple that Jesus Christ, Zerubbabel, as we read, is, is building. He is building, that he, that he will finish. Let's go to Romans 8. Romans 8. Here's the final, final scripture here. Romans 8, another familiar one. In verse 12, we'll start. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, not what, what they were doing in Haggai when they became intermingled with the society around them. That's not, what we're, that's not what we're about. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you live through the Spirit and do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, this is very encouraging to me. This, this whole passage is super encouraging to me. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again, to fear, that again refers to the fact that we have, been, we have been taken out of bondage. But you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We are the children of God. A new, a new kind of temple. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Incredibly encouraging words, brethren, as we move toward the spring holy days and the Passover season. Let us remember the lessons of Haggai, that there is work to be done, that uh, the temple is to be built. Jesus Christ is the builder of that temple. 
He's building it. He's using us. We have a part to play, but we have to learn to submit our will to his to be part of what he is working out. It's an incredible uh, plan, an incredible inheritance uh, to us. Let's consider our ways and remember that God is with us.